Good morning and welcome to Conservation Biology, Biology 340 at Wilkes University. I'm Dr. Jeff Strafford. This lecture is the second part of Habitat Fragmentation. Okay, just to review, um, I wanna go over the effects of fragmentation on biodiversity. It's bad for nearly all taxa. So especially uh, if we look at vertebrates, um, we know that there's declining diversity with increasing fragmentation, which mean the, uh, the distance of the fragments and the size of the fragments. So smaller fragments have fewer taxa. The matrix matters. So the matrix as is a filter for species moving around the landscape. And some things will find it easy to pass through uh, any landscape. Uh, so if you look at urban fragments, you have some predatory birds that find it very easy. Well, appears to be easy for them to move through. And you can imagine something like a salamander trying to move uh, within the urban landscape from available habitat to available habitat, it'll experience a very different uh, dispersal. And the question is, why, why does uh, fragmentation have the effect that it does? Okay. And uh, we know, for example, that uh, colonization is decreased, so you're going to uh, disrupt that in a normal population and continuous habitat. You have organisms moving around between uh, patches, so the population itself will, will move around, but um, on the whole, it could be stabilized by this extinction colonization dynamic. But when you fragment, you essentially only have extinction without subsequent colonizations, okay? And that again, depends on the, the species in question. Smaller fragments we know, like I said, has less biodiversity. And that's because a smaller fragment has a smaller population. Smaller populations are more uh, susceptible to extinction and also, a smaller fragment, you're less likely to sample all the possible habitats. And now I want to get into edge effects. And edge effects are those um, abiotic and biotic changes we see along a forest edge. So this is a one hectare uh, plot in the Amazon. Here's the corner. So it's this is 100 meters, and this edge is 100 meters going back. And um, so the edge would be where the forest plot meets this pasture. Okay, you see a little bit here. So here you have this very hard edge uh, where the forest meets essentially grassland. Okay, so abiotic effects. So here's the here's the edge, and I think the sun is to our left here. So you can imagine this edge is getting a lot more sun, okay, than say the interior of the forest fragment. So there's much more sun, which means it's hotter. Uh, there's also more wind, so that combination makes it drier. So it's it's hotter and drier and more sun. All right, so we can divide up the effects of, of these two things into direct and indirect effects. So if it's, if it's the increased temperature, that may affect things like ectotherms, like insects. Uh, other ectotherms would include um, insects, lizards, um, snakes and plants as well. It could be too dry, which this would strongly affect insects, and then plants and fungi as well. 
and the sun, the amount of sun is going to affect plants. And some plants, I have here too sunny for plants, that may seem like an odd thing to say because plants use light for photosynthesis, but some plants are adapted to the shade and will um, essentially, um, they'll over photosynthesize and you get, what is it called? Photorespiration. And um, so some plants don't do well when exposed to direct sun, okay? And then you have indirect effects. So these are the things that follow from the previous things. So if, if for example, you rely on a particular plant for to get uh, for pollination and that plant disappears from the edge, that pollinator will disappear from the edge as well. And then the other thing is a direct effect, which leads to indirect effects as well, is it's too windy. So the prevailing winds here uh, come from the left and here's this edge, but you can see the, the canopy as opposed to this side is much lower, okay? And that's because there's been several blowdowns where trees are exposed to the prevailing winds they get knocked down and so you get really shrubby growth um, in response. So you get lots of light here coming in plus the missing canopy. So you get this really dense undergrowth here. And let's just talk about vegetation along a forest edge for a minute. So initially when you build a, a, an edge, it's very exposed and light will come in at very high rates. And what happens is uh, available light that, that won't go unused, plants will rapidly grow and, and fill that up. And they essentially seal in the fragment. It's not perfect, but it does increase. Um, if you look at the core, so of the fragment, it actually will grow out, or we predict it should grow out as the edge seals itself. Uh, but you, what you do get along that edge, among many edges, is incredibly dense uh, vegetative growth. And if you think about the canopy as being where you have dense growth, think about the, the canopy uh, going down, I should go this way. Think about the canopy of a forest fragment essentially fills out along the edge and goes vertical. Most of the time you think of the canopy as horizontal, but it can actually bend down towards the ground and that seal, right? So this shade from the top will also come to shade the sides as well, okay? But we still know that um, edges are, um, are still hotter, sunnier, drier, windier, et cetera. All right, getting into the biotic edge effects. Historically, uh, if you look in the literature, uh, journals such as the Journal of Wildlife Management thought edges were um, a wonderful thing because they're good for things like deer and turkey. And that is absolutely true. So these species um, like dense vegetation. Uh, it's a place to eat and they feel safe there. Uh, turkeys will put their nests often in dense vegetation in the forest. So by creating edges, you created a great landscape for deer and turkey. However, uh, fragmentation may affect a subset of organisms that negatively affect other organisms. And that's what we're gonna look at in the next couple of minutes. Okay, perhaps in the most famous uh, case of how fragmentation negatively affects a species through biotic interactions is the case of the brown-headed cowbird. Um, this is a brood parasite. So what it does is it lays eggs in the nest of other birds and that bird raises the cowbird. Um, here's a female cowbird and this may seem like a strange strategy. So female cowbirds don't build their own nests, right? They don't even take care of their young, but they can lay 40 eggs in a season and if you think about a typical songbird in North America, let's say in Pennsylvania, 
they lay three to four eggs and they may have two clutches. So at best, you're looking at, say, 10 young. And at best, a cowbird could look at uh, 40 young. However, nest predation is pretty high. So it probably doesn't work out that well. But uh, nest parasitism is um, a very successful strategy if you just look at the number of cowbirds out there in the landscape. Let me just get into what they do. So this is a wood thrush nest from a wood thrush study. And these blue eggs are the wood thrush eggs. And this is the, the one that doesn't belong. This is the, the cowbird. The wood thrush may or may not recognize this as a cowbird egg. However, if it does and remove it, the female cowbird will actually come and destroy this wood thrush's egg. So it puts pressure on the wood thrush to keep things the way they are. What happens is this young cowbird hatches and they have receptors on their hind end. And what they'll do is they'll push against anything in the nest that touches the end. So for example, if this cowbird egg hatches out, starts to get big before these eggs hatch, it can push these eggs right out of the nest. It can push their nest mates right out of a nest. Oftentimes what you have is uh, it'll push, say there's three eggs here, it'll push two out of the three eggs and the wood thrush will raise one wood thrush and one cowbird. And if you can imagine that decreases the uh, reproductive success and thus the fitness of the uh, wood thrush. And if this happens often enough, it can actually um, lower the population size. And we know that um, cowbirds were a huge problem for one bird, the Kirtland's warbler, that almost went extinct. It went down to, I think there were 200 pairs, maybe even less than that. And this is a, a Midwest bird. It likes early successional pine forests. So that, that was another issue. So I say partly responsible. You had two things going on. You had um, habitat loss because a lot of the pines were maturing and they uh, didn't have a natural succession to set them back. So these, this species likes early successional pine forests. And uh, what nests were left were getting heavily parasitized by uh, brown-headed cowbirds. And what this graph shows below is you can see the number of pairs of, um, so this is a census. I think these were singing males. So this is probably an overestimate of the population because not every male that sings would be paired, uh, but this is a pretty good indicator. So the, the population was hovering very, very low. And what they did was they started rounding up uh, cowbirds and removing them from the landscape. And uh, you can see how the Kirtland's warbler uh, population responded. Now, this isn't the only thing they did because what they were also doing is uh, restoring these early successional pine forests. So these things together resulted in what was really near exponential um, population growth. So that's it's a nice success story. And um, again, this is, this is a Midwest bird and actually the populations have gone up enough that we actually once in a while accidentally get a Kirtland's warbler on the East Coast during migration. Uh, and it's also might be uh, partly responsible for the rapid decline of wood thrush. So in Pennsylvania, wood thrush have been declining uh, extremely rapidly and the cause is not clear. It might be, uh, as I suspect, a lot of it would be uh, habitat loss on the wintering ground in Central America. But also uh, you have population declines as what's happening in North America. And one of those things would be uh, the, these brood parasites and uh, the brown-headed cowbird population. I just wanna point out um, that 
these explanations of brood parasitism uh, causing the decline in birds may not necessarily be universal. So just for a moment, I wanna talk about the generality of this hypothesis. And in 2005, around there, I wrote a paper that used the uh, Gulliver as an analogy to biologists and how we take our explanations at work around us now and we like to transplant those ideas and our, our preconceptions just as Gulliver, when he landed in different, so sometimes he was a giant and sometimes he was uh, very tiny compared to the land where he was. So these were his adventures. And the whole time he, his ideas were being transplanted in these places where they didn't necessarily make any sense. So if we look at the generality of brood paras parasites, in some places there are um, issues. There's bronzed cowbirds in the tropics. Um, you find these in South America up to Texas and Louisiana, but however, they tend to be specialized on Orioles. And then in Europe, there are cuckoos. Um, these are actually fairly large birds, not like a little tiny cuckoo in a cuckoo clock. Um, in Europe and Africa, uh, however, they don't respond to fragmentation like brown-headed cowbirds. And one of the issues about brown-headed cowbirds and fragmentation, I didn't make that uh, link, is brown-headed cowbirds like uh, residential lawns. They like pastures. These are birds that were associated with buffalo. And so these are grassland birds. And when you make suburbs and you have agriculture, you're really uh, creating habitat for brown-headed cowbirds. So their population goes up and then they can target birds in these little small fragments that are pocketed around agriculture and urban landscapes. So this explanation does not work very well outside of really Eastern North America. Um, one of the things that, that's not here I wanna point out is that you have a new cowbird in North America. It's expanded its range, uh, the Caribbean islands, the shiny cowbird. So the shiny cowbird we know is now well-established in Florida. And this is a generalist parasite, brood parasite. So I know it's spreading. Uh, it's probably in Alabama, probably in Texas, uh, making its way north to uh, Georgia, Carolinas. So if this, if this brood parasite becomes successful, there'll be another generalist brood parasite in the landscape. Okay. So the two um, big uh, biotic uh, consequences of forest fragmentation, one is brood parasitism. So the other one is nest predation. Nest predators are things that go into the nest and eat the eggs or the young. And so um, what you have is the situation where birds like to nest in very dense vegetation that I said was associated with the edges. So normally in a, in a continuous landscape, a tree falls and you have dense vegetation growing in that very sunny spot. And that becomes the spot where birds would go. And these would be pocketed throughout the landscape. In a fragmented landscape, these shrubby areas are growing around the fragments. And these nest predators will just, you can track things like raccoons and they will just walk around the edge of forest fragments looking for a bird's nest. The other nest predators are things like raccoons, skunks, possums, crows, jays. These are called mesopredators or mesopredators because they're not apex predators, such as a coyote or a bear or jaguars or lion. Mesopredators are stuck in the middle. So raccoons, skunks, possums, all those things, crows may be eaten by apex predators, but they themselves are predators of things smaller than them. So meso meaning stuck in the middle, right? So these 
things are often positively associated with fragmentation because they are uh, not strongly affected or positively affected by human pre the presence of humans. So in agricultural landscapes, you have lots of raccoons, lots of jays because of supplemental feeding uh, from say corn. And then the birds in that landscape will be hit hard by the, the increased abundance of these mesopredators. Uh, we call that an ecological trap because what happens is normally nesting in shrubby growth increases your fitness, but in an ecological trap, that same behavior results in decreased fitness. Okay. And so um, I did a study on wood thrush and these are two nest predation events. So on the left is a uh, Cooper's hawk uh, visiting and eating the young. And uh, on the right is a red squirrel, which is normally an inhabitant of um, pine coniferous forests. They eat lots of pine cones, uh, but they're also nest predators. And so this is uh, shrubby growth with uh, associated with state game land 205. And this was a forest fragment. The left was not. The right is a forest fragment outside of Allentown. And uh, lots and lots of wood thrush. Uh, hardly any of them were successful. In fact, I don't think we had a successful nest that year in this landscape. Um, we also had blue jays eating the young. So this red squirrel is actually pulling a uh, young wood thrush out of the nest. How general is nest predation? Uh, we don't know. So we don't have, if you look at forest fragments in agriculture and urban landscapes in South America, um, you don't have the raccoons and skunks as you do here, although they, you do have skunks and raccoons. They just don't respond to fragmentation down there like they do here. So even suburbs have lots and lots of skunks and raccoons. Uh, and then throw in the mix in the tropics, you also have things like coatis and coatis, and uh, which is like a raccoon and tyras, which are like giant weasels are in the landscape, but how they respond to fragmentation is not well known. So we still have lots to figure out about nest predation around the world, really. Okay, so that was a downer. You know, if you're a wood thrush trying to make it, you get brood parasites and nest predators, and it's really tough. Is there anything positive that comes out of fragmentation? Because it is happening. Um, so as I mentioned before, deer and turkey do well in a fragmented landscape. You have more dense vegetation. So if you think about what that might mean, uh, there's more fruiting plants, right? Uh, raspberries need lots of light. And uh, you can visit forest fragments in uh, around Wilkesbury, and that's where you find the raspberries along edges. And you have, if you have fruits, got to have flowers, and then some plants just have uh, uh, flowers, regardless of how, if they produce fruit or not. But edges tend to have just more dense growth, which means more flowers. So you actually have higher insect diversity in some fragmented landscapes. And we're just figuring out the effects of forest fragmentation on insects. So this is uh, just beginning and there's lots and lots to uh, discover and figure out about the effects of um, fragmentation on insects. Uh, we do know things like hummingbirds benefit from uh, forest fragmentation down in the tropics. But let me point out that the fragmentation that was studied in the tropics was in an agricultural landscape where hummingbirds were moving uh, over pastures. They were not moving through the city. So I think an urban landscape will be very different from an agricultural landscape. But again, the urban landscape is not well studied in the, in the tropics. The other thing that, um, you know, and this is a hypothesis, um, if you have dense vegetation, 
and you have more insects, especially those that eat leaves, the, the folivorous phytophagous insects, and you are an insectivorous bird, um, the edge, because you have greater abundance of resources, may actually help you offset the decrease in area. But that is a hypothesis that is not well explored yet and needs lots and lots of research. Okay, so even though this chapter is about fragmentation, I just want to point out the effects of edges and where edges are uh, other than forest fragments. So linear disturbances such as roads and right-of-ways create edges. So this edge is not a road. This is a uh, right-of-way at the Jacobs property, which Wilkes owns. And you, so you can see that there's dense vegetation all along these edges. And so if you are a nesting bird, this will look like great habitat. But if you are a raccoon or anything that eats eggs, uh, you're going to search and just walk along this edge looking for those looking for those birds. Um, so edge effects are important to understand, uh, especially if you're looking at the whole landscape. All right. So I have to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, if edge effects are to be avoided, what you want to do is minimize um, the amount of edge per area. So the optimal would be a circle. So if you look at the ratio of edge to area, a circle is the tightest and would have the most area. The next would be a square. And then the other shapes have much less. So if you remember, um, edge effects penetrate the, um, the forest fragment at a certain distance. So if you can imagine if it's, if it's the width. So if edge effects go the width of this uh, fragment here, this entire uh, patch would be disturbed where it, in that same landscape, this one would have a core area. This would have a core area as well. Uh, triangles and things with the very acute angles uh, have it very bad because these have edges, edge effects coming in from both sides. Okay, same thing here where it's it's coming left, right, and from the bottom and the top. Same here. So you nick off the edges here. But when the angles are very sharp, you have very high disturbance along these points and it reduces the, the core area even more. So these are just four shapes. If you imagine you have very irregular shapes, the more irregular you have, the more edge you're gonna have. So the, the more you can smooth out a forest, uh, the less edge effects you're gonna have. But let me just point out, very rarely will you have the opportunity to uh, determine the size of a reserve or the shape of reserve. You're, you're pretty much stuck with uh, your boundaries. Okay, so that's the lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please send me an email.